Hey everyone, uh, welcome into the room here. Uh, this is the WGF Library Script Breakdown. I'm Lauren O'Connor, your co-host for this event. Hi everyone, I'm Javier Barrios and we're the librarians at the Writers Guild Foundation Library. Um, as you may know, the WGF Library collects and provides access to film and TV scripts on the first floor of the WGA uh, West building here in LA. And you're probably wondering when we'll open our doors uh, to in-person visitors again. <laughs> We're still not sure. Uh, hang with us. I know it's agonizing. It's agonizing for us too. Um, in the meantime, stay safe. Um, and if you have questions about a certain script or anything script related, um, you can always email us at library at wgfoundation.org. Um, now, if, the, if this is the first time you're joining us for one of these script breakdowns, you might be wondering what you're in for. Yeah, absolutely. So the way this works is uh, Lauren and I sit down virtually uh, with a writer and we talk about the script they wrote and we share pages on the screen. So for you to kind of look, look through. Um, in the past, we've broken down TV scripts, but today we're doing our first feature, which is for me is a real treat because features are definitely my first love. And uh, the first feature script, uh, Zach, you're the first feature wow. script that we're, uh, that we're breaking down on WGF Library Script Breakdown. Uh, the, the script is King Richard. Um, so I hope everyone out there can uh, virtually give a round of applause for our guest, yeah, Zach thank Balin. You. Thank you. Huge welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so also since the script is 124 pages long, so we've added an extra half hour to our running time today since it's usually an hour long. So uh, okay. enjoy. Um, yeah, so we've got the remainder of 90 minutes and uh, we're going to go through this script in detail. Um, and if you're watching this on Zoom uh, and something sparks a thought, um, feel free to submit questions in that little Q&A box you see on your um, main navigation panel there. Um, and I think um, the script was posted on deadline yesterday. Um, so we'll go ahead and share that um, with everyone. Yeah, so if you wanted to follow along with in a little more detail while we're kind of talking through it, there you go. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, start this off with some contextual questions just to kind of get us in the talking mood. Absolutely. So Zach, thank you again. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so tell us uh, a little bit about uh, how you became a writer and, um, and also like why you write the kind of movies that you do write. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks. Uh, this is so fun. I'm so excited to be here. Um, you know, I think I always I th was really fascinated with film. I was kind of like a classic film obsessed kid I, I mean i played a lot of sports but i also like spent most of my summers hanging out at this video store in wilmington delaware where i grew up and um you know i don't know that i knew exactly which avenue into into film i was wanted to pursue but i i was always um i always loved writing my my mother is an english teacher i went to johns hopkins in baltimore and i studied creative writing there and and film and so i think there it's, I don't know, at some point that, that I, I really just fell in love with kind of the, the process of screenwriting specifically. I, you know, I had some classes at Hopkins that really, um, I, I loved the sort of restrictions of it. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, it felt like, I don't know, probably naively, it felt like a easy way into the industry <laughs> that it was, I was like, oh, well, it's free at least. And, right. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so, so I think I very, I very naively thought that I was going to get out of college and I was going to write a spec script that sold for, you know, <laughs> money. And then I, I would figure out sort of what, you know, how to make the movies that I was really interested in making. And, you know, I, I didn't sell a script for 15 years. Right. So um, I got, when I left school, I, I, uh, I went to New York and I started interning at production companies and I got into physical production. So I spent like, you know, 10 or 12 years in New York working as a, as a set dresser and a prop. And, and then I was, you know, I was writing on the side, I was writing in the prop truck on like Gossip <laughs> Girl and a bunch of other productions that I worked on. Um, but, you know, I, I really loved the, the, the idea that, you know, it's for a, for a little while, like in the film production process, like, you are in control of everything and mm -hmm. and you can really decide obviously not just what story you're telling and what characters you're you're creating but you know the tone of the film and 
and for a moment that whole thing is yours and I you know I especially when no one was reading my scripts that was really you know it was um that I loved the that for for a little bit you know it was exactly what you wanted it to be yeah um, good point. and so I think you know I think that was th those that was my sort of en entry into it and then you know as I was working in production um you know I met I started to meet other writers and um it's kind of you know th those became entryways into things for me Oh, I have great. the quickest, quickest follow up to that. Yeah. Um, since we're script librarians, we have to ask, um, when you were starting out writing, um, did you read a lot of scripts? Do you remember? I, so many. Yeah. So I used to, you know, I, I used to come up from Baltimore sometimes in, when I was in college and go to New York. And at the time, hmm. this is, these probably were illegal, but they used to sell like printed screenplays on the sidewalk yeah. in New York. <laughs> and, you know, this is kind of pre-internet or I guess just early internet days. But yeah, I mean, I remember coming up in high school and buying the script to Goodwill Hunting and yeah. buying the script to like French Connection and things and, and taking it back and just being in, you know, finding scripts to movies that I loved and really trying to figure out like, okay, how, how did, not just how does the dialogue work on this, but how did, how did a writer move people through a space? And, um, you know, how do you, as a writer who is just sort of figuring things out, like, you know, if, something that's a one or in a movie how how does that look on a page right um, so i read a ton of stuff and then in college i read a lot and then i i always whenever they whenever the you know studios would put out there for consideration scripts i downloaded everything and, and just and read everything and then i was on set a lot so i was reading you know yeah. i was reading all the you know and those scripts are different obviously once you're going in once the scripts have become set for production than what you might obviously write mm -hmm. speculatively and so it was, it was eye-opening to see what those differences were. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks for that. Um, mm -hmm. so, so now for this project, uh, tell us a little bit about it from like the very beginning. Like, did you, like a couple questions regarding it. Like, how did you come up with it? Um, why Richard Williams? And then why focus on him, right? Instead of Venus and Serena and, 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 this, and why focus on this particular uh, moment in their, in their lives? Yeah, sure. So um, the project like initiated for me, um, I had a, I had a, I was living in New York. I had a general meeting with this producer named Tim White, who is one of the producers on the film. Um, mm -hmm. Who's a great guy who has a company called Star Thrower. And we were meeting about a totally, you know, it was just a, just a general really. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was leaving, I was just very fortuitous. I was leaving the meeting to go to the U.S. Open because um, I'm, a, I'm a big tennis fan. And I mentioned that to him and he was like, well, okay, well, if, you know, if you like tennis, maybe, like sit back down for five more minutes before you leave because there's a movie that I've been trying to figure out for a long time. And so Tim had grown up, he had played junior tennis. He had been, um, you know, a contemporary of like Venus and Serena, not, he, he's very good. He was not that good, but like, but he had, he had been really interested in Richard as a character and the Williams family's trajectory and had you know, been pursuing writers for a long time and trying to figure out the way into it. And he said, you know, I think they were, they were close to hiring someone else. And I just immediately, I remembered Richard as a character. I, you know, obviously I was huge fans of Venus and Serena, but um, just the, it just felt immediately like such a huge cinematic story. I didn't know what it was at that time, but thinking about um, the, that family in Compton, the inc incongruity of tennis in that mm -hmm. in that setting, and obviously you know everything that they that they achieved and I, I assumed overcame. Um, and so I just went home in a weekend. I you know I told him like please like don't like sign some paperwork with someone else for a weekend. Like give me a minute. Wow. And, and I went home and I just read everything I could about Richard and, and the family. And, you know, to your, to your question about why Richard as the protagonist that, I mean, I think part of it was just the way that the, that the story came to me um, mm -hmm. that there was so much footage of Richard as mm -hmm. a, in those years. So Richard right. had been so forward facing, um, you know, as the, basically like not just the coach but like the publicist for the girl so there's all these interviews with him and so that's sort of where I started uh because I knew from the beginning that and, and Tim 
I had talked about this too. Like, I don't think either of us were interested in a movie that was about adult Venus and Serena, you know, right. trying right. to replicate the highlights that we've seen on, on sports center, like didn't feel mm -hmm. inherently dramatic. So it was trying to, to find from the beginning, like what was the window in this, in their lives, in Richard's life, in, in, um, you know, the whole family where, where they were in the midst of the crucible, you know, where everything that they had dreamed um, and aspired to was going to either make or break in this moment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we looked at me and Tim and, you know, eventually the film, you know, looked at other kind of quote unquote, like biopics that didn't try and tell the whole life story of someone, but distilled right. it down to, so it's not the same movie at all, but I really like uh, Good Night and Good Luck. Mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to think of the approach like that, like you you learn everything you need to about Murrow in that moment, but it's told through the lens of one experience. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that was something we looked at. And then and Richard just I mean, frankly, I just thought he was the the one the most unusual, charismatic, yeah. um, you know, unpredictable, larger than life character right. that I had really ever come across. And the way, you know, the way he speaks is so it can be so poetic but also so outrageous and right. you know he had so many different facets and the fact that he had concocted this really improbable idea of how he was going to both find respect for himself but also lift his family up in in a way that is i mean it's frankly it's ludicrous that it works and right. that, that as the you know that just felt like such a classic sort of inciting incident and so a lot of the pieces sort of fell in around that that's amazing yeah, uh, yeah that whole stay for five minutes i got a story for you that gave me goosebumps yeah. <laughs> I, mean, it's like, I mean i feel it's these things are i i didn't have really any credits at that point like the fact that i was in that place at that moment it's it's really yeah. it's just it in some ways it's total dumb luck in it and then you ah. you, you have a I knew immediately, I'm like, I, this is an incredible story and the, no one, sh there's no reason right. should be offered it. And, and the fact that it's been dangled in front of me, like I have to just grab it. And so yeah, it was, that's, it was that's, that's so great. So from there, how, like, how do you, how did you find the confidence to kind of like move forward, writing a true story about living people? I mean, I, I know like so many people watching this, like probably everybody's got an idea about like an iconic person that they'd like love to turn into a movie. Um, what would be your advice, you know, to people wanting to tackle that? I mean, I, I'd say go for it. I think that, that, that there's something really, I, I found, I had never written, um, I, I guess, no, maybe I'm wrong, but this is one of the first things that I'd written that was like, absolutely factual and and um but i found it extremely liberating because i knew that there were again like i was saying before that there was very there were a lot of restrictions in terms of where the story could go and what it could be about mm. and i found that actually really freeing because i saying okay these are the parameters with, within, within which i'm working and the the questions and the obstacles became different than when you're just staring at a blank page you know so i yeah. Um, but then, you know, in terms of like getting the voices right and getting the, um, you know, authenticity of the story, I just, I really immersed myself in everything I could. You know, I, I, I felt like at least for a moment, I was the authority on the, on the Williams family and, you know, I had read more and seen more documentation than anyone probably outside of the, you know, the five of them. And <laughs> Um, or you know, seven of them, and 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 I had a lot of confidence in both in understanding what I thought Richard's like journey was. Obviously, my life is totally different than Richard's, but that you know I, I was in my you know I was thirty six or something. I hadn't I had sold some things, but I had never made a movie. I didn't. I, I was at a point in my life where I was I was really sort of desperate to see whether or not I was ever going to produce something and, and, and right. be part of something that I was, was really special. And I, and I identified with that moment that I felt like Richard was in, in, in my script. That was like everything I, 
I had a lot of belief that I, you know, could write and could be a part of like, you know, the filmmaking process, but it hadn't happened yet. And, and I, I kind of stuck to that idea within Richard. Um, and then again, like I, I really like trying to use real nuggets of real dialogue and those things. So I felt like I had a, I had a backbone of, of some, um, some actual beats of Richard's, Richard's voice that then I could try and work in and then and sort of build around on my own. Right. Got it. Um, so what was your, uh, we want to know how you wrote this movie. So like, what was your first step? And do you outline and like, what's your day to day writing process like? I'm kind of a mess, like in terms of um, <laughs> like what I do every, I mean, I write every day, but with this one, you know, I, I like, I had to secure to, to get the opportunity to write it. I very quickly had to send star thrower mm -hmm. a, you know, a pitch of some sort of like what I thought the movie was. So what happened with, I'll try to keep this somewhat truncated, but essentially that weekend, I remember I read, you know, I read every, I read Richard's book, Rick Macy's book, mm -hmm. Serena's book. Oh, yeah. um, and then I watched, you know, a, a lot of video and there was a, I found a ton of, um, there was a great resource that there was a lot of, the New York Times had covered Venus and Serena, like, or they covered Serena in those years. So I had all that stuff. And I had found the anecdote about the Vicario match, you know, Venus's first pro tournament. I've, and that that had lined up with the the prospect of signing her first deal, and I sort of found where I thought Richard's arc began. Yeah. And I sent an email to Tim and Trevor. Sorry, Trevor is Tim's brother. Um, that like Sunday, and I said, "Here's the movie. It starts here. It ends here. And it's like, and Richard's journey is this. Like, you know, it's the story of a guy who is." who has been disrespected his whole life and has, has gone through so much drama that he's determined one way or another to lift himself up and it's going to, he can be outrageous and he can be off putting when he does it, but that if we can understand what is at the core of that, then it will, I think it could change a lot of the way that he was perceived and the family was perceived, you know, in the, their time. So that core like structure of the movie remained the whole time. And then I went off and I, then I did a ton of other research. We, you know, I spoke to people in their life. I spoke to Paul Cohen. I spoke to um, other junior tennis players that had come up around them. And, um, and then I outlined the script. And a lot of times what I do is like, I will out, I won't outline scene by scene, but I'll outline some, you know, sometimes I'll do sections, I'll do acts and they can be, cause sometimes, you know, you're outlining a scene and, and as you start outlining that scene, you're like, oh, I actually know all the di I know at least some of the dialogue ideas. And then that becomes a page where another section of the script is might be 20 pages in the script, but I only have these seven beats. But I really like, you know, I I break it into sections like, okay, this is Richard. Richard is pursuing coaches and right. will fail. And then um, so I had probably a 10 or 15 page document that. I then took, um, and all the while, you know, in research, just highlighting, you know, highlighting little dialogue that I felt like was going to go somewhere. And, um, and, and then I, you know, then I went off and wrote and, um, and the whole time, you know, I, I have, I usually keep like multiple final draft copies open where I have, like, I might have a file draft file. That's just like a bunch of Macy lines that I wrote down. Right. You know, that I that I, either I found quotes or I, I wrote things, you know, I feel like Macy in the when he's pitching Richard is like has to say this. And so then I have that file and but I might not write those scenes for, you know, I might not get to that for like two months. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, then I write I, I try to write something like on the first draft. You know, five or six pages a day right. and then go back and try and you know, then revise that. So, um, so that first script, like that went, that ended up on the, you know, on the blacklist, um, you know, I, I don't know, that was probably four months or so after I'd gotten the job. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, not that what, the blacklist didn't happen then, but I think that script that 
we right. went out. But then this was kind of an unusual process too, because when I when I got the job and started working on it with with Tim and Trevor, there was like the caveat was like we didn't have the rights to the story. <laughs> so right, right. Uh, I should have mentioned that. So uh, <laughs> we all sort of thought like, okay, we had, we, you know, I thought we thought we had a good way into it. We had a, we had the pitch essentially, you know, and we could have potentially at that point tried to go to Venus and Serena and say, you know, we want to make a movie about you. Here's exactly what it is. But I think collectively we felt that, you know, I, one, like there were, me and Tim and Trevor, all three white guys. I don't have a, I didn't have any credits. Like it was not, we weren't like coming in with a powerhouse package to, to get them to sign off. And um, so that I think we felt like the best thing to do was to try to really bring them a, a great script and um, and say like, this is this is the story that we, we really want to tell. And we want your help, you know, both, both bringing it to life, but also that there were, there were going to be things that I knew even in all the research that I was not going to be able to accurately right. depict without hearing their stories and hearing their voices and, and also, you know, knowing what it was like in their home and in their community in a way that I was never going to get right um, just on my own. So, right. And, so we had that script and then, then we went about, you know, trying to get that script in front of them for a long time. Oh, cool. And if, and did they finally get on board? And if so, what was their like involvement like with the script? Yeah. I mean, it was a really interesting process. It was basically, um, they did finally get on, on board. We, um, we, you know, I had never had anything like this happen before, but we sent, you know, you get this, you finish the script, you send it to your agency and we, and, we very quickly got a call back that Will Will was interested. Wow, uh, which was really obviously like incredibly exciting. And, <laughs> um, and but again, with the caveat that he was like, "This is I would like to. I'm interested in doing this, but you know, with the one, only if the family is right. at least you know giving us their thumbs up to to move ahead with the project." And um, so we spent a lot. Tim and I really spent a long time trying to make contact with them. I, I, they've obviously had a lot of interest in someone making a story about their lives for a long time. And um, we were eventually able to sit down a year later at the US Open from wow. that first meeting with, uh, with Isha Price, who is one of, the, one of their mm -hmm. sisters, um, who, right. became, who became a producer. And right. Isha had lunch with us and you know, agreed to read the script and read it and came back and basically said, you know, if you guys are willing to like, sit with us and hear not not us trying to sand the edges off the story but you know maybe maybe correcting things that were culturally inaccurate that were not mm -hmm. part of you know that were not specific to their story if actually we could make it more specific um then they were willing to like come on board yeah. and, and help facilitate the movie so then each isha came on as a producer venus and serena later came on um and, but then the process for me became, I sat down with, with Orsine, um, their mother, you know, a handful of times and interviewed her. Um, we went down to Florida and sat with Venus and interviewed her. Um, and, you know, part of, part of sometimes that was going through the script and saying, okay, in this scene, you know, tell us more, like, tell us what it was like. What did you guys, what did you eat for dinner? What did you, what wow. did what did Richard show you? If you, when you were allowed to watch TV, what did you watch? Like the, right. those things. So scenes like the Cinderella moment in the script came out of that, and um, and then you know, and then I rewrote with with some of those things in, in, involved. Wow, cool. Well, we should uh, get the script. Get to the script, right? Yeah. Oh, actually, one last question: Like, how many drafts uh, did it take to get to the script that we're that we're gonna uh, look at tonight? Or today. Um, you know, a thousand or something. Like, <laughs> right, right. So it's countless. The, yeah, right. I mean, the script that went to like that Warner Brothers bought, and that you know, I would say like obviously there's so many of these micro drafts along mm -hmm. the way, but there was like the the blacklist script, and then there we had like a 2.0 version, which was mm -hmm. the one that we worked on initially with the family, and then that was like the pre-production draft. So there were like 
sort of two big iterations that got to the pre-production and then throughout production, you know, probably a hundred or at least. Wow. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> Keeping that top of mind. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> all right. So um, we've got Kat uh, behind the scenes here. Who's going to uh, put the first page up on screen. Cool. Um, let me just get out of this uh, so I can see my questions. Um, okay. Um, so we're on page one here. And um, I think, you know, our first question is like, why start the film here um, with Richard at the Palos Verdes Country Club collecting tennis balls? Um, how was that? Like, why did you choose to introduce him that way? Um, you know, I think I wanted to, to start the film immediately and show the juxtaposition of the world that Richard mm -hmm. was attempting to enter and showing the showing Richard in that setting. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to introduce California in this sort of hazy dreamlike place and that, you know, these, these tennis clubs um, obviously were primarily white, primarily very wealthy. And that also to show that Richard, you know, was someone who was willing to walk into places that were he knew were we're going to be uncomfortable and do it without, I think, a ton of ego. I mean, I think he was somebody who had a lot of ego, but he was willing to go in hat in hand and say, like, I need tennis balls. And it, I just felt like a really um, a, a way very quickly to understand who this guy was. And also, and, you know, the I had read about that he was going around to different different country clubs and collecting tennis balls out of the trash cans right. and that it just seems so cinematic and and such a such a clear way to say where he felt like he was in the world cool got it um so let's let's move to page two um and i want specifically to kind of look at yeah, the description of the van here, you know, part mobile tennis clinic, part mobile home. It's filled with school books, cassette tapes. Um, how did you go about getting experiential details like this? Um, well, I think this stuff is always kind of tricky. I'm sure everyone, well, other writers feel this way, like you, to put a big chunk of description in the middle of your script, like it's, you, sometimes you're wary of doing it, but it, um, you know, we talked about this, from the beginning of this van being like another character in the movie right. and that I knew we were going to spend a lot of time in it. And I don't, I would just, I, I mean, I, you know, was all the accounts of Richard, whether it was Macy's book or Richard himself or sports illustrated when they were interviewing him, everyone talked about that. It was like the Batmobile, this van. Right. And so <laughs> I, really, I really wanted to, um, to, to, to be able to feel the texture of it. And so, I, I mean, this, this paragraph was always in here almost verbatim. And you mentioned, um, you know, working a lot uh, in the art department on various, you know, TV shows and films. Um, has that influenced uh, think, your, your writing of description? <laughs> I think it has, honestly, like, you know, I, I try to like, I always hate putting like food scenes in movies now because I'm like, oh, the art department is gonna hate this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, it is because I mean I think that you're especially if you if if you know I really want this to be in here, then even if it's not going to make it through the through the process, it's like something you're really hanging ad on and saying like you know rich dad poor dad like that was yeah. important to to be in there. I don't know that we see that in the movie, but I think it gives a lot of context to to Richard. Um, and then you know. It, we also talked about this in particular, like it, the, the family in this van was, you know, it felt like a, like a band on the road. Yeah. And one, it, and I don't think we've ever seen it within this, like in this milieu. And so it felt, it felt important. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, so Kat, we're five pages, five and six. Um, so this is when we uh, introduce uh, Venus and Serena with the phone books. Um, so like, how do you approach uh, character descriptions and, uh, and how did you settle on, on this opening for them, for their intro? Yeah. Um, I like, 
I mean, I probably tend to like overwrite a little bit, but I, I like to try and introduce a character in the way that, that the audience is going to. So on the page, like it says, you know, two young black girls, but it doesn't, as an audience, if you were watching it, like you don't know that those girls are Venus and Serena yet. So I think trying to introduce the reader to get the reader hooked on who these people are, even before you've said their names, because there's mm, no yeah, yeah. that. So I think I often, I think I often do that when I'm like introducing characters on the page. Um, and you know, I, and I also think willing to like give it a little more time than it is going to be on the screen. So there's mm -hmm. another paragraph after here that like you know gives right. them descriptions. Um, yeah, there that is. And again, that <laughs> even <was> a rascal. <laughs> <laughs> right, a rascal. Right? I love that word. <laughs> like, and these, yeah, I think these these lasted in the script like through everything. And I, even though like once you go into production, this is not necessary, but I I felt like it was always, mm. I don't know, for me, I always wanted to read, you know, to know who I was walking in the scene with. Um, mm. And then in terms of the action, uh, this was a real thing that Richard and Orsine had the girls do, that they would all, they had jobs forever. And um, even when, you know, when they were much younger than this, they were delivering phone books throughout the neighborhood. Um, and again, I, I th thought to introduce them in a way that was that was separate from tennis, um, that showed their unity, their they also it's like competitiveness. It's you know, probably not totally like we feel it exactly, but that also that Venus was incredibly deferential to Serena in terms of their like like she would let Serena win all the time. Mm. And so, there, you know, it's just a little moment of kind of her at the beginning of the film, like allowing Serena to reach the house in front of her first. And right. I thought that was like a, a good little snapshot of their dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, it really it really does work. Um, cool. So um, page let's move on to page 10. Um, so I, what I love once we get here, we kind of, you know, you've set up the story. We know the family at this point. Um, so can you talk about, uh, how you created the first 10 pages? Like, like, what did you see? Uh, how did you do that? And did you see an inciting incident happening around here? It was actually really tr tricky. I mean, I think that the, in terms of like the inciting incident, um, I think we kept as a, you know, filmmaking group, we kept sort of moving what it was. So in an earlier iteration of the script, um, the, Later, Richard has a long sequence where he is sort of courting coaches. And some of that now we moved up to the, you know, at least you hear him talking a little bit. Right. And then they're kind of, we've kind of linked the, the sections. But, um, you know, the, I think for me, the inciting incident at this, you know, in this draft, in this version is kind of the Richard being assaulted on, on the court after the right. tennis lesson, which just sort of, if this is, if these first 10 pages, you know, and kind of that classic idea is setting up what the world of our characters inhabit, then at that moment, um, we sort of realize for Richard why this goal needs to escalate and needs to change mm -hmm. you know, immediately. And it's not just that he's, you know, the courts that they play on are dangerous, but that you know, the whole operation of the professionality of what they're trying to accomplish cannot really succeed right. in this environment. Right. Um, and then, you know, these and, tennis, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. And just to be clear that that, that happens after page 10 for the audience and just trying to let them know that that, that when he yeah. gets beat up. Right. Yeah. I think so. Right. Um, so cool. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of takes us, um, Let's move to page 15 um, after uh, Richard gets beaten up and and um, particularly the, there's like a line, uh, yeah, right there in the middle of the page, uh, daddy got beat up again and they're singing the greatest love of all and doing their talent show. Um, and we noticed that this was actually in um, the draft that was on the blacklist. Um, and I, I, my question is, um, it's, it's just like, it just feels, this is like a great, you know, familial kind of like moment. Um, and my question is, um, can you talk about bringing, um, you know, the sisters and Oracine more, um, you know, into the story? Yeah, so, so that was probably the biggest, you know, 
a change and a, a hugely positive one from like the blacklist script to this mm -hmm. one. So that that draft really focused much more on the sort of relationship between Richard. I mean, it's the same story, but but Orsin and the and the three other sisters did not have as much space. No. Um, and once we sat sat down and spoke with Orsin a couple times, obviously we realized how instrumental she was not just in the household where she was the primary breadwinner and um you know running everything but that she was also uh, a huge part of their tennis coaching um and that she also had to teach herself to play tennis to sort of facilitate this this dream and wow. um and so you know, once I got to spend some time with her and actually really hear her voice, because the, again, like Richard did so much in, interviewing, he, he was constantly on camera. And I, you know, obviously you're the voice that you, that you present on camera is different than the, than the way you might speak at home with your, in an intimate setting, but I really didn't have anything on, like, on or scene. So, you know, tr I think that what is in the script now is really accurate to who she is I and mean, how she speaks. And, um, but that really came out of sitting down with her. And then, um, you know, I would give Ray Green a lot, a ton of credit to um, Ray as the director. And, you know, that we sort of, you know, I think he came in and, and really said, you know, we need to build these other characters out in a way it was really gonna feel that this is a, this is a household with five different sisters who all have extremely different dynamics. And, mm. and you know, that can be hard, really hard to do on a page because yeah. it's hard to give everyone the space that you can give the, your protagonists. Um, so I think that, I think there are things that are not in the script, but that we tried to sort of, you know, get in there enough that when the actors were together, that they could build out their own relationships and stuff. So, um, right. but yeah, I mean, that became just like a really collaborative process to try and figure out, okay, how do you, how do you service a family of seven people um, on the page in the script? And, and some of that stuff ends up like inevitably like having to be production stuff. Right. Got it. Got it. Um, so if we can, uh, we can just kind of like breeze uh, to you know page 18 here. Um, and I just really, um, <laughs> cause they're not going to make it as singers is just like a really great line. And I just, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, let's go to page 20. Um, the scene in Vic Braden's office, um, because here we just see that uh, we see Richard's just utter relentlessness and that he doesn't really worry about obstacles and he doesn't worry about looking foolish. And um, I guess my question here is, um, did you have any, I mean, obviously you're basing this on, you know, the real Richard Williams, but did you have any other um, characters uh, that you look to kind of for inspiration? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think there were, there were certainly like other films that we looked at, you know, I, I remember I, I watched Aaron Brockovich a lot when I um, was doing it and just sort of like the, someone who is, single-mindedly yeah. moving forward um, and is, can be crass and, and sort of, and sometimes off-putting, but, um, and is gonna do things the way that they're going to do them, right. whether or not. Um, you know, we looked at like great Santini and some other things, but, but ultimately I think what's, what was interested, interesting about Richard is that, you know, he was, while he was, could be really domineering to, the outside world, like when he is, when he turned inwards to the family, he was really like a soft kind of goofy guy. And that, that dynamic surprised me when I read about him and talked to them about him. And I thought that that would, you know, be surprising to the audience as well. Um, but I don't know, it's a good question. I, yeah. Not necessarily, I don't think that there were like other, I don't remember. So I looked more at like film structure and probably than I looked at other characters. Got it. Right. Um, well, and I also, while we're kind of holding on this page, um, uh, if you want to just kind of like, just go a little, scroll down just a tiny bit, Kat, um, with the other direction. Um, I just want to kind of, um, 
uh, just so there's this scene in Vic Braden's office, but it's a con when we were looking at the blacklist draft, you know, there were lots of scenes of him pursuing lots of different people and you kind of like condensed it here into just this one moment. Um, and can you talk about kind of doing that? Yeah, that I mean, that came about as we were you know, mostly in, produ in pre-production, like trying to figure out I mean, in some ways, like just how to get the page count down a little bit. Um, and I, you know, I really liked the sequences where it was, where it was, it was a bit of a montage, but they were, you know, it was intercutting between Richard yeah. kind of giving this, mm -hmm. this spiel to four or five different people in different mm -hmm. locations um, and then ending and coming back to, to Vix, uh, to Vix. And, um, and we, I think there was a collective decision that was made that we didn't need to see him doing it at all, you know, over and over again, that we, if we came into this with the context of, okay, obviously he's been doing it a lot. And then we also moved some of those beats up to the opening of the film. Um, but I don't know if I really, I always kind of like the other version, but I think that, you, <laughs> but what I've, um, you know, I think what you, what I, what I realized being on set too, is that, things that sometimes things that are on the page that, that read really well, you know, you have Will or you have Anjanu or, or John or like these great actors and um, you're like, you wrote a whole monologue that was beautiful and they just like wink at the camera and you don't need anything that you wrote. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, what a discovery. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Let's, uh, pages uh, 23, 24. Um, so at this point, you know, um, Richard's been turned down, right, repeatedly. And so now he's kind of feeling low. He goes to the, to the tennis courts to have a moment of contemplation. He's uh, taking stock of his choices so far. Then the gang members that were harassing Tundi uh, come back into the picture. Um, so, you know, then he then he witnesses the drive by that he almost caused um, that. Like, how did you get the details of like the gang violence that was happening in that particular time? Um, you know, like, how did how did you accomplish that? Yeah. So this is it. I mean, a lot of people cite this like as the most kind of quote unquote, like unbelievable part of the story. And I, I think I, when I, when I turned in my first draft of this, to so like my, my manager, the first thing he said was like, well, that story can't be true. Right. And <laughs> that is like pretty, you know, it's pretty verbatim from, like, from right. Richard. so um, if this always felt to me, like in just in terms of story architecture, like, you know, it's, there's kind of like an act of God that happens in this moment that, um, that just felt really sort of special and, and, and a great uh, moment where he was so down and something happens that um, maybe gives him that one last like bit of wind to, to right. take one more shot with his family. Um, but in terms of the specifics of it, you know, I think the original draft of this looked a little different. It was more yeah. slightly, um, it was a little, actually it was that was a slightly closer to what was what Richard had had described mm -hmm. um but when we you know m working with Ray um and and the Williams family about some of what other experiences they had witnessed in in Compton at those times right. that I think um we we conflated a few different the story that Richard had told about the gang members that he had seen murdered and a story that um that Isha had told us about another someone in their community who had also been killed. Oh, um, interesting. And and then you know a lot of the kind of dialogue with the with the actors who play the gang members. Um, you know, Ray, we did a lot. We were very fortunate and did a ton of rehearsing. And so and part of that was because you know we shut down COVID for a long time and then we came mm -hmm. back and so there's a long period. But we rehearsed and then I would rewrite based on things that people had said, I was like, okay, this is, you know, that sounds a lot better than what I'd written and put, you know, kind of work in, in that way. And, and, you know, Ray and we did a lot of research just about Compton at that time and tried to, tried to depict, you know, I think a, a version that wasn't all, you know, obviously it was a violent place, at the, but it was also, you know, a very loving families were living there and there was a real sense of community and to try and, um, to do something maybe a little different than, than what had been done in the past. All right. Yeah. Good point. 
Um, so yeah, so then he he sees the drive by here. Um, it's interesting because, like you said, it's it's almost like destiny intervenes. And I you hear sometimes writers say that you're allowed one like one moment where things kind of just work out for the hero magically. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you know, you're like you're allowed one of those moments per film. Um, but what's interesting here also is that you go from that world back to Beverly Hills, you know, back to like, like another, like they never, they'll, they'll never hear about the story, you know, yeah. and over there. So I thought that was, that's, and, and that's, and I feel like that's kind of what you do throughout the script is just go back and forth, which is very, very, um, it, it's very effective. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, so if, uh, I guess let's move, uh, move to page 33 specifically, um, you know, so, okay. So after he witnesses this drive by, um, and, you know, decides to do like one, uh, you know, keep pushing, um, he ends up in Beverly Hills. He's trying to convince Paul Cohen to coach the girls. Um, and, but what I specifically like about this scene, um, is that at the very end of it, um, it ends with, you know, it, it ends with this question. Um, what do you think? Um, and I just think that's a hallmark of, of good writing to end a scene with a question rather than answering it in the same scene. So we have to go to page 34, um, you know, where they, uh, they get home and, uh, there's a nice diversion of expectations here because they come home totally glum, but then they've got a coach, but then there's a caveat. It's just for Venus, not Serena. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering, is that like a conscious part um, of your writing process, you know, kind of like making sure to divert the reader's expectations and throw curveballs? Like, does that factor into your drafting uh, scenes like this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I, I spend a lot of time, especially when, you know, if it's a first draft that people are going out and reading of like, the last thing I want anyone to do is like get to the end of a scene and then be like okay well I don't necessarily need to see what happens next mm. and so I spent a lot of time probably more time than I need to like working on these little lines that get from one scene to the next so that you're you know there's you're you can't hopefully like you can't stop reading because like a sentence never ends because you have to get to the next page to see what the even if it's just you know like here you know or a scene prepared for the worst and then like that's something that's just driving your eye to the next to the next moment but then obviously cinematically and story-wise yeah you want to you you want to hopefully leave with a question or a suspense or something that is going to pull you into the next moment um and so i mean i can tell you that that paul cohen thing there's a there's there were drafts where he says you know what happened at and he says richard you know for a long time there was a draft where he says richard you know it was still a question, but he said, Richard, you're not crazy. And we all, it was a really emotional moment in the scene reading it because it was like, you've had this guy for the whole 30, first 30 pages of the movie who feel like everyone has told him like, you're, you know, you're, you have no idea what you're talking about. And this one guy says like, you know, you're not crazy. And it was a moment of like, there was, it was cathartic, but it also, I think in reading one, it, it, didn't do what you're saying, like pull us into the next scene with a question. And then it also, I think it, it sort of rewarded the character a little too early. And, okay. and so, you know, we, we, we pulled it out and, um, but yeah, I think, it, I think if you can do what you're saying and, and sort of always like, you know, but then the, the mm -hmm. reader, then it, even if other things aren't working, you can kind of at least get them to turn the page. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, okay, so let's let's move on to um, about two thirds of the way down uh, on page forty. I, I just want to there it is. Uh, the description of Rick Macy is like really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other question, the other thing I just kind of wanted to note is, you know, Paul's got this monologue here. Um, is there a reason why? Um, part of it's in italics or the part about the agents is is in italics um i'm looking at it <laughs> um yeah. you know i'm not sure actually on this yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just it's kind of you know it, it puts attention on yeah. you know getting noticed by agents and like you know yeah i'm all for in scripts like you know highlighting doing anything that you need to to like uh to 
to to highlight something because you know, there aren't that many times as like you know once it's out of our hands you know yeah. you, I I mean I was really I got to be on set like for every day of this so it was it was wow. unusual but that most of the time they're taking it and it's like anything you can do to highlight the things that you think are important so um I actually I, I don't remember doing it in this right. scene but I do that sometimes <laughs> it's effective yeah. um Okay, so let's let's go down to uh, page 44. Um, and here, Venus has been training with Paul. Um, she's gonna start playing some matches. Um, and on this page, we just wanted to kind of draw attention to A, this montage, um, and B, this parenthetical. Um, yeah, like right midway down the page here um, that says Richard uh, watches apart from his family, which has become his custom uh, to escape his nerves. Um, and I don't, you know, this is just me drawing everybody, everybody who's watching this right now. It's like, pay attention to that because it comes back. Right. Um, as a <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, certainly that was something that we wanted to make sure that we threaded through and that it was going to pay off at the end of the movie. Um, and because if you've you know if you've seen it that at, at the end he's watching venus's last match in a tunnel um mm. and after she is you know is is losing he comes out and joins the family yeah. um and he's told that story about his father walking away from from the adversity that he saw his son go through yeah. and so that was something that we that we all wanted to to, to weave in there this this was really difficult to 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 figure out because so that in earlier versions you know th there were many things going on in this in this montage of juniors um so obviously there was just like the traditional sports stuff that is venus um kind of destroying her opponents and, and climbing up the ladder but then and that's exuberant and should be exciting but at the same time we were trying to show um you know richard's displeasure with the way juniors um you know handles yeah. psychology and so that's kind of a that's that's sort of going against the energy of of what venus is going through um and then these are ended up being very technical tennis beats in the film so there was all this was story was always in the script but i wrote it different ways throughout the process right. so it, you know it was very elliptical at one point and then it became very granular in this way. Yes, and that leads me to like in page forty-five. So you know the the whole that whole technique you use here with uh, girl one, girl two, you just kind of just flows down the whole month, the whole sequence just flows down the you know down the page, venue three and so forth. Um, how did you come up with that way of of, of handling this sequence? I think kind of trial and error, but then it was also working with with production um, and really saying okay how, you know, how many how many tennis beats are we going to have and mm -hmm. and how many actresses can you cast um so some of that was was very production specific um mm -hmm. you know i knew because we repeated several of the same same tennis venues we repeated you know a couple of the players came back and you know she played them again right. um so some of it is just like a you know, it's finding the brevity on the page that can facilitate right. the thing, you know, production needs. But then again, also like, I, I mean, I'm going through this on a script now, but we're, we're getting right to the end of production or right, they're about to start shooting and, you know, getting notes from the location department and things to, can you just change this to it's inside? And then can you say, so-and-so, you know, walks into a room. And I'm like, why well, do I just don't like the way that reads? You know, I mean, I yeah. know that you need that for, but still like someone is, you know, this is the one thing I have ownership on is like the way this looks on the page. Right. And so a lot of times it's like finding production at that point might not give a shit about. <laughs> right, right. Like, but you're, like, um, so I think it's, you know, some of that. That's amazing. I think, you know, you're always looking for ways to, um, you know, to do things with, with brevity but also to capture the feeling of what the scene is going to be. And right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So page 46. Um, so the, che the whole cheating part, you know, where he says, call it. And obviously the girl, the, the father is telling his daughter to cheat. Um, it kind of 
feels like a prelude to what happens later on in a professional match. Um, like, can you, uh, can you, do you have any thoughts on like how, do, how you crafted these kind of moments or, you know, where you got them? Yeah. I mean, I, this came out of just real conversations with Venus and Serena and, um, and, and Isha just about, you know, what, when we really got into the nitty gritty of what was it like when you were on those courts. And um, so I, Venus told us specifically that this, you know, not this incident happened, but all the time, you know, that, that there were people were taking little opportunities to try to get a leg up. And then I think that, you know, anyone who's played tennis is a, is a strange sport when you're playing it in the junior levels. Cause a lot of times you're just playing, you know, it's probably a little like chess or something you're playing one-on-one and then you go and report what happened after the match. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you get, Two 12 year olds out there like they're not necessarily <laughs> going to call the most ethical line um but then yeah you know knowing where the where what was going to happen at the end of the movie trying to find some mm. some delicate ways to to foreshadow that yeah um, well that's a good way mm -hmm. um and then uh page 48 <laughs> so the moated <laughs> Uh, corroded and your booty, your booty exploded. Like, like, is that, that, that has to be a real line. I that bet. was a real, yeah. I did not <laughs> um, that, again, that came out of just like sort of conversations with Isha really. And just, you know, a lot of times I was just peppering Isha and just saying, you know, come on, like just give me some of the, <laughs> give me some of the little things that you guys, like when you're in your bedroom, you know, at night where you guys like, what is the like crap that you talked about, talked on your parents or any, so Anyway, this was like a little. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's <laughs> funny. It, feel, it feels so tween, you know. <laughs> and then the girls, then like Demi and Sanaya were always saying it all the time. So it, I think it ended up in the script a couple. It ended up in the movie like more than once. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, we're going to move to at the top of uh, page 55. Um, so Venus, you know, has been kicking ass. She's been winning. Um, and then the, I think you mentioned the Cinderella moment. Um, it's like, and then the, the gangsters kind of like are rooting for them. Um, so with the whole gangster thing, it almost seems like that's where you sort of wrap up a, um, a subplot. Um, and do you think of this, uh, how, do you, how do you handle subplots? Do you, is, is this kind of like, like, do you see it as concluded here and now we're you know, gonna deal with the rest of the subplots or how do you, what do you think about subplots? I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, this, this was something that definitely I was tracking in the background and it, it took different iterations. You know, I had more at some point that there was a, there was an intermediary scene at some point where Richard returned to the courts, um, ran into this character and there was a, what it looked like it was going to be a confrontation. And uh, Richard was sort of able to tell the young man, um, you know, that we're, we're both going to be dead if we keep going on this way. And that, um, mm. which was something that I had read, you know, R had Richard had talked about. So there was, I believe that, you know, there was one other beat in, in kind of this subplot story. Um, but, you know, when we were, we cut a couple other tennis scenes, so we knew we lost it. And then, you know, was hoping that this, this scene sort of closes that loop because we, I knew that when, when Macy eventually came to Compton, that it was, I think it was really important for if if for all the first half of the movie, Richard has been the one entering these worlds that feel where he feels out of place. Then when Macy arrives at those courts, you know, we want I wanted to give him that same experience, mm -hmm. um, and 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 to have those those gang members sort of accost him in the way that Richard might have been accosted. And so I, you know, I knew that the loop of this story had to be closed before Macy arrived. Um, and, but yeah, I, I think you're like, it, it, if you have time and you can do them, it's really, I think it's really fulfilling because it just makes the, makes the world your characters are moving through feel, feel bigger. It's not just, yeah. they're not the only people in the world. Right. For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's move now to page 58. Um, and yeah, I think uh, it's just such a great moment with Serena secretly signing up for a match and the random dad saying, you could have warned us, man. Um, can you talk about um, focusing on Serena uh, on this page in this moment? Yeah, so this is a real story. Um, there was more of this as well that like 
that there was a whole scene before this where that was in other really right until the end i think we shot it um that uh she had sort of they used the kids used to go through like richard's like office area oh, and yeah, yeah. desk chair and collect money mm -hmm. that he had dropped out of his pockets and that she had collected money and had stolen a form and had filled it out. Right. And we saw, we saw her in bed at night whenever all the other girls were asleep, like writing, mm -hmm. filling out the form. And so yeah. she put it in. Um, and then, you know, we, we cut it down. Um, but this, I don't, this is for me, it was a really, you know, pinnacle moment in, in Serena's arc. And obviously, you know, I think that a lot, we, I knew that people were going to go into the film probably knowing Serena more than anyone and maybe have the expectation that Serena was going to, you know, maybe have a larger role in this part of the story. But, you know, what I knew was that for one, Venus really was the one at this age who was hmm. identified as the, the phenom and that Serena's experience in those years. And she talks about it you know, a lot was that she was, she was in the shadows and that she was, she kind of felt overlooked and, and that a lot of that fueled her. Um, and so knowing what sort of the way the film was going to be structured and knowing um, what sort of real estate I had for her, you know, I thought that the best thing I could do was sort of lean into the, the both the expectations that the audience was going to have about how, you know, where she presented in the, in the film. Um, and then also, sorry, um, and then, um, you know, and so to give us as the audience, like her experience. Got it. Um, and then um, moving down a little bit to page 60, um, in that blacklist draft that we read, um, there's, you know, like a New York, you, you have the New York Times writer actually like approaching the family. And in this draft, it just cuts to them reading an article, um, which is done with, you know, great economy. And I just kind of wanted to point that out too, just so people can kind of get a sense of the iterative process. Oh, um, and um uh, and then in this moment, too, we also see um, the beating of Rodney King on TV. Um, can you talk about the decision to kind of include that um, in the script and or and other like little details and things like that? Yeah. Um, so as I was researching, you know, the this was not something specifically that the family had mentioned or that, uh, you know, that I had read about sort of in context of them. But you know, being aware of what the time frame was of when this moment in our story and where they were located, and um, you know, the timeline in our film is really it's very accurate. So the Williams family left Compton um, several months after the hmm. the Rodney King beating, That's and amazing. and right around the time where they went to this uh, "Just Say No to Drugs" event that Nancy Reagan was hosting. Um, and so it, you know, it always felt to me like a really, it was going to be a very seminal moment in anyone's life who was growing up in, in yeah. Compton at that time. Um, and it felt like a really, the, the place to put it was here that was going to sort of juxtapose between where the world that Richard was about to walk into. And also, you know, in other drafts of the script, there was a longer period between Rodney King and sort of like I had earlier where Richard spoke to many different coaches trying to, you know, solicit help. There was sort of the inverse of that where now a bunch of agents were coming to him and we saw several scenes right. and um, yeah, again, just throughout like trying to be more concise and trying to, you know, allow the story to lead you as a, and instead of explaining everything that, um, that showing Richard watch this moment of um, where you know, a black man's life and agency has been totally disrespected and taken from him to then walking into the, that scene where essentially that is what Richard feels like is happening to him at the, with the agents. Um, it felt right. like a, like a real turning point. Right. Interesting. Um, wow. Um, okay. So let's move down to um, page 67. Um, and just for everybody's context, uh, you know, Paul, Coach Paul wants Venus to start playing juniors, but Richard is worried. Um, and I just want to guide everyone's attention to the bottom of the page where Paul says, um, you pull her out of juniors now and you'll ruin her. 
Um, can you talk about articulating the stakes, um, you know, for people who don't know how tennis careers are built um, and might not know what those stakes are? <laughs> yeah, so th this was was really important for me. I, I I felt it was very important to to get across that you know most people don't know the specifics of how a junior tennis phenom escalates up the ladder to become a professional. Um, and, but it was really, I mean, this is the moment where they have to make a really critical decision that is going to like either determine, I mean, one way or another was going to determine the course of their professional careers and their, and their, and their, and their lives really. And so, um, you know, I, I know that there were drafts where there was a lot more, where I said exactly like she has to play juniors because, you know, <laughs> right. these, these 10 things happen when you, you know, you have to get an agent, then you have to, and right. some of that is still in here, but, you know, I think it was continually like boiling it down, boiling it down and, and to try to get it to the most clear thing. I think basically he says, Paul, if we trust Paul as an expert and Paul says, you're going to ruin her, then, you know, hopefully yeah. that, you know, that does enough. And I, that is stuff that took me a long time to sort of accept on the page. Cause I wanted, you know, I put in a lot of specifics and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I, I don't know, for me, that's been a real sort of learning curve is just to understand what, what the audience will understand, um, coming from someone who is perceived as an authority and you don't maybe necessarily need to know yeah. every aspect of the way, you know, the USTA. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent point. That's, yeah. that's excellent. Good thing. Yeah. Good thing and it learn. seems like that's the learning curve for everybody. I mean, like stakes right. and exposition are like yeah. the hard, the hardest thing. Yeah, but um, it, it did feel like it was very natural that the stakes really were really huge at this moment. And as long as that we understood that they were and we believe them, then, um, right. you know. Got it. Um, okay, so let's move down to um, page 74, uh, where they get Rick Macy to Compton. Um, and I just like, I love, <laughs> I love Rick Macy's voice on the page. Um, and can we just talk and dig a little deeper into um, developing characters voices? Um, because I feel like that's just not talked enough, uh, talked about enough in, uh, in screenwriting. I mean, these two, for me, I was just, I just felt like so lucky that one, Richard has, you know, an incredible voice. And then Macy was like this other like mirror image of him <laughs> in, in terms of like his energy and the weirdo sayings that he used. I mean, Macy wrote a book that it kind of chronicles a lot like different chapters on different people that he coached. But then at the end of the book, there is a like bibliography of Macyisms. So I had like, <laughs> you know, I had like 20 pages of things like, you know, pop the popcorn, extra butter that I was able to, you know, to, to use. And then, I don't know, you know, then you just kind of hopefully like you get in the flow of talking. Like I was probably talking like that at home to my family. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, then also, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, then I was just say like, but then Barenthal, who's like just so amazing in it, I think, you know, he would... Um, when they were rehearsing, he would, he would say things and I was there and I'm like, okay, that's, we got to get that in. <laughs> um, so it was kind of like a huge calling process, but it, I always, I had like the, the, Macy was the most fun to write for sure. Yeah, I bet. Who, I bet. who was the most challenging? Or scene for sure. Um, and, you know, I think that the early drafts of the script really did not get her voice right. And I, I'm really proud of the way she reads now, but, you know, I think that I was, um, you know, I, I was inventing a lot and it, it was, it was not authentic. It wasn't, um, it just wasn't who she was. And she, mm -hmm. she's very, she's very reserved and deliberate in the way she sp speaks and when she speaks, but when she does, she can, you know, can be just as, you know, explosive as Richard. And then, and the Venus was tricky too, because like, like a bit like we seeing, like Venus is, is very quiet and very, mm -hmm she's very self-assured and um but is is very self-spoken and and was at that time and so finding a way for her to be you know to be present obviously she's a huge a enormous character in the film but who doesn't have a ton of dialogue and so 
you know, that, that was tricky just to make sure that throughout the read that you're continuing to make sure that you're tracking her. Yeah. 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 Right. Cool. So let's uh, move to page 78. Um, I think you, you kind of talked about this, but the whole, the gambler, the song, the gambler and the Cinderella, like were those things that, 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 that they actually did, they feel so poetically linked to the story. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, like oddly, Richard was like a huge country music fan. So <laughs> um, there was this song. And then the other song, it was almost like two at one point I had in the script, it was almost two on the nose. Um, it was this, this singer I had never heard of before. His name was John, I believe it was John Anderson. Mm. And the song was like, I'm just an old lump of coal, but I'll be a diamond someday. <laughs> and it was like Richard's, Richard's favorite song. And it was like, you should listen to it. It's so on the nose of what the movie is about, <laughs> but it's like, um, but it's this beautiful, very strange thing to see Will singing it. And, and so, you know, those, that was, there was, there was a right. point where he was singing that early in the film. And then, um, and, um, but the gambler was another favorite of his. And that was always, for me, it was just like, well, you know, this is a guy who's holding his cards and. Um, yeah, totally. And maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's a little on the nose, but I, I love it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite moments in the movie. Like yeah, that, just yeah, that transition sure. from the meeting in their house to you know, kind of being on the road, and that song comes in. There's just something yeah. kind of magical about it. Um, so and so, I so we noticed like in, you know there were flashbacks in previous drafts, and then you know you smartly you know, kind of took those out effectively. Um, like, like, can you talk a little bit about like what like because especially because they're about Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, those we took out really as soon as, and I would say Ray was a huge part of that, but like um, as soon as Ray came on board, I think we all said, let's get, if we can find a way to get this information across and we don't need to have them, let's get rid of them. Um, but yeah, there was, there were flashbacks to Richard's youth. Right. Some of the, you know, some of the racism, some of the abuse that he had, that he had faced. And I think it just, I don't know, in the initial read, maybe it was helpful, but in the, in what the movie we were making, um, that was so linear, like it, it yeah. just took you out of Richard's perspective when you're, when we were reading through it. And then there had been a scene, um, in this section here, where it was not a flashback, but where they, the family on this, this, you know, this was a real drive that they did and they, you know, they moved out there and on the way out there, they stopped in Shreveport. Right, the cemetery, right? And Richard took right. the family to the house that he had grown up in, right. and it was pretty powerful. I mean, it was a page, you know, it was a, it was a page in the script, and Richard, you know, you got to really see what, you know, where he had come from. Um, but I think that, you know, in some ways, that was a production thing. We couldn't, we couldn't get to Shreveport, and it was not going to be able to, like, accurately reproduce it in, in Los Angeles. And then I think we also felt like that that story that he tells on the tennis court later to Venus um, achieved what that scene would have achieved. Right. Cool. So now page uh, 88. Um, so, um, so the reporter, right. So Richard jumps in to defend her. Um, we just, that we're just calling attention to this piece of writing. That's, that's just brilliant. Like reporter is silent. Trousers probably wet. Because Richard is frothing, because I mean, the, the, he just lets him have it. Or like that, that is a that's such a great reaction from you know from from the other character. Um, and then uh, page ninety. Um, so th so this is this is cool because um, you know this is when um, when Avina starts taking uh, like yeah yeah to talk to my dad. She starts taking agency. And can you talk a little bit about about refocusing on her uh, at this point? Yeah. So I think that. For me, I, it was probably even in that like initial email I sent to the producers, like that it was, you know, it was going to be a a, st a story that begins with a guy who is, um, who has a dream for his family that is really, but a lot of it is about himself, right? right. That the things that Richard wants to achieve through, in part through his kids, um, are are dreams, the internal dreams that he has for himself about, you know, finding, finding respect and finding self-respect. Um, but then over the course of the film, what Richard has to learn is that 
you know, he has to cede the, that agency to his, to his kids. And that, that through that, you know, some of his, um, some of his feelings of, of respect and, and uh, self-determination are going to come out, but actually through stepping aside and letting, letting his children right. sort of move forward. Um, so I think there was, there was, you know, I had always looked at it as kind of these dual, dual narratives that like at some point Richard was going to, to succeed, Richard was going to allow Venus almost to become the protagonist of, of the story. Um, so then, yeah. you know, this, I think this is the sort of the first moment where, where Venus really takes hold of that and, mm -hmm. and steps forward. And I mean, I think that in the, 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 you know, the scene with Paul Cohen in the middle of the film where they basically fire Paul, say, we're going to quit juniors. That is, you know, in some ways that's the, about the midpoint of the movie. And that is a moment where Venus is watching her life being dictated. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. From there on, she begins to, to sort of change her trajectory. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so I want to be kind of cognizant here that we've got like 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not so, in a rush, but I don't, if other people are getting bored, you know, I'm great. Um, let's, um, let's go down to page uh, 92. This is just another one that's like, you know, more of a comment, less a question. Um, but uh, this, uh, yeah, Capriati's mugshot. Um, I just think it's, it's cool to call attention to that because that's like a steak razor without any words mm -hmm. where he just like sees it on TV and it's like, oh no. Um, and uh, which, which leads me to um, page 98 um, where, you know, Richard, you know, basically tells Venus that she can play juniors, but then, you know, kind of sees what's happening to Jennifer Capriati and changes his mind. And um, Oracine is just as distraught as Venus about it. Um, and here we come to this really powerful argument between Richard and Oracine. Um, and um, just wanted to know if you could talk about that. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, this is probably my favorite scene in the movie. Um, and it was, it's, you know, it took different iterations at different drafts, but, um, you know, this really came out of, a it evolved out of a conversation that I had with Orsine when we first met Orsine. Um, this story here about Richard's, you know, previous family and his other kids was in the script. It was in a different place, mm -hmm. um, and she basically had was looking through the script and said, oh, "Like, oh, this is going to be in there." And myself and the producers were saying, "Well, you know, we really think that it we need it. We need it in the movie that if we're going to be truthful about about." Richard, this is a huge part of his life and we need to address it. And to her huge credit, she said, basically, okay, well, if you're going to, if you're going to have it in the movie, then let me tell you what really happened. Mm. And so she said this, you know, beat to me about, you know, that Richard, he showed up in, in his red Nissan truck and knocked on our door. And so that was always kind of this centerpiece of what this this scene was going to be um and then we'll i mean the one note the one thing i really remember about the scene is that we sh the night before we shot it we were um we had finished the things from the night before and and ray and will and ingenue who's really amazing i think um we stayed after on that house that we were shooting at for a couple hours and we just said okay let's go through the scene one more time because we've been rewriting and rewriting it and we the, will and Anjanu read it and i took you know that last rehearsal and rewrote it and brought pages back in that morning and and so it the what's in the film like was rewritten the night before basically and wow. Wow. um but it was all you know it was sometimes it was more explosive sometimes it was it was a, a little less, but it really, I mean, for me, this was the moment where Orsine really gets to, um, you know, I, yeah. I, wish, I yeah. wish she had more moments, I, frankly, in the film than, than this, but that um, I, I'm really proud of the scene. Well, yeah. and I just, I love the button, um, like it, it, on page, yeah, page 99, where it's just like, cause if you don't do that, she's gonna be the one who leaves you. And that's just like, a punch to the gut yeah. like and you can just visualize that and oh um okay 
what else? Um, oh, oh, and then and then that leads us right into you know scrolling down a little bit on uh, on page ninety nine, which what I think is the most powerful scene in the film, where Richard and Venus have this heart to heart. Um, and I noticed this monologue, um, the, you know, the monologue Richard has about his father walking away, um, appeared in like a completely different scene, different context, um, in that earlier draft. Um, and can you talk about your decision to kind of include it here and about writing the scene generally? Yeah. Um, so there was always this scene, yeah, moved around a little bit, um, this anecdote and, and there was a, another version earlier before like kind of Ray got involved this scene took place in a bedroom and you know I think this is the thing that like obviously like great directors can do is, is that he was saying like this this shouldn't be in a bedroom it should be yeah you know yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. it needs to be on a tennis court and then that for me then I was like okay well tennis court now they're on opposite sides of the yeah you know now they're on they're, now they're opponents and they can you know they can meet in the middle at the at the end of the scene and that felt very thematic um but you know this is there there had been a couple very long monologues i i mean i it's i'm sure everyone else who's a writer watching this like it's fun to write these um they don't often like make it into to the movie. <laughs> right, right. Uh, <laughs> right, right. but luckily like will was you know will really wanted something big at this moment like this and so we actually i think he found this story um this specific story mm. and brought it to ray and i and, and and so because there were i mean unfortunately richard had had dealt with so much you know violence and and racism in his in his youth that there were a lot of anecdotes to choose from what he was going to explain to oh. Venus, what his, you know, what drove him. Um, but Will very smartly, like, I think located this one. And then, and then I, you know, I wrote it and kind of went from there. So. Wow. Cool. Let's, let's move on. Kat, let's move on to page 107, 108. Um, mm -hmm. There's, um, so this is, this is a cool thing because it's like, now you're writing the game, right? So you're writing about sports on the page and, how do you approach like it's because also with tennis is so technical. How do you approach making it understandable and engaging for the reader? Um, I mean, I, I felt that what was most important, at least in the, in the initial reads. So I think that, you know, what I learned through this process and people probably have, have known um, it, that, you know, you're, you're writing for different reads. So in the, blacklist script that did not have a studio that did not have a production you know it was really the writing was probably like popular than this and and was really i was trying to just get people's eyes to fly right. across the page and to capture you know the excitement but i actually you know i had the specific points of the match so i was um i was able to write you know she hits a drop shot and, right. it, and i knew those things um but yeah, I think yeah, I think it's it's trying to find a medium between being overly um, overly specific in a way that is you're you're going to lose the energy on the page, right? Um, but um, you know, specific enough that that production can really work off of it at that point. Um, and I don't know, you know, I I go back and forth about I, I really like Tony Gilroy's scripts. I'm like a big fan of. Yeah, he's a great writer. So. Um, you know, I looked a lot of just about if you, this is obviously very different. It's tennis. It's not Jason Bourne, but I did go back and look at sort of how, you know, how do really great economical writers mm -hmm. get action across on the page. Right. Yeah. Good point. Um, yeah. He and, gets read, he gets read a lot here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, cool. Um, oh, so let's, um, uh, Let's see, let's move on, Kat, for time's sake, uh, to page 115, um, which is an amazing moment because as, as Lauren and I talked about this, it's like Batman donning his first suit, right? Because we, this is where we see Venus's iconic, you know, like 
her look that we know that if you Google her, this is the look that you see online. So like, and this is the very first time we see this and it's almost the end of the script. Um, any comments on, on, on coming to that moment, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm in like, in my idiocy, like this, the, in earlier drafts of the script, this was like not, I did not make a big deal out of this. And at some point, I was like, oh my God, what a hugely missed opportunity to, to unveil it in this way. And I think part of that came because I, in a conversation, the scene before this, which is really one of, one of my other favorites in the movie is when um, Orsine is braiding Venus and Serena's hair. Mm -hmm. And there's a story that's told yeah. about Sojourner Truth. And, you know, that really came up, again about talking to Anjanu and talking to Orsine about what it, you know, obviously what are the things that I'm going to miss as a white man, maybe that I, that about the experiences of having young black daughters that really should be represented in this movie. And this was something that, that came across and, and Orsine really talking about that, that, you know, it was Orsine's idea to, to give Venus and Serena those braids That's at an awesome. early age. And it was really about you know, that they were going to be in the public eye and she wanted them to wear their heritage very proudly and to, um, you know, to not try and do anything to necessarily like force themselves to assimilate into what the tennis world was, but to walk in as who they were and carry that with them very, with, you know, with a lot of pride. Yeah. And so that, you know, that became the scene before this. And then, um, and then, you know, I just, it, it, once that arrived, it was very clear that there was an opportunity for hopefully, a, you know, a really powerful, iconic moment um, that, that was the reveal. It was really Venus coming into her own as a, you know, as, as an individual, but also, a, you know, as a young black female superstar. And um, right. I thought Ray did a great job with it. Yeah, well, bravo. That definitely accomplished it. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, uh, so let's jump to page 19. Um, 119. With, uh, with Vicario icing Venus here. Um, it just, again, it just feels like a nice payoff to that moment um, earlier where, you know, the dad tells his daughter to cheat in one of those earlier matches. Um, it's just like not the first time that we're seeing something like this. Um, you know, I've got the question here. Can you talk about this a little? But I think like we got it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you mentioned it before. Yeah, only that this is, I mean, I, I, it's not, part of me feels bad like that Vicario becomes the villain of this movie, but I mean, this is a, this happened. This is a, a true story. And, you know, it happened in this moment. And, um, and when, I mean, this is one of the first things for me, I think I said earlier, that really locked in like where the movie would end um, mm -hmm. because it was such a test of, you know, not just about tennis, but about character and how you would, how you would respond to that. Um, and, and it also, you know, struck like structurally for me, one of the things that was always really complicated is okay, everyone knows what Venus and Serena go on to accomplish in their life. So how do we, how are you telling a story that still has, um, it's not just episodic and anecdotal, but that actually has some dramatic tension and suspense. And what are we, what are we building towards at the end of this movie? Um, and so trying to construct the sort of, um, connection between, you know, the sponsorship deals, which was real, you know, those things really happened at that moment and what was on the line at this match. So even though we, you know, which for me became beyond, obviously beyond the finances, beyond what the career would become, but about the things that Orsin and Richard really were trying to instill for Venus and Serena and all the sisters about what success looked like yeah. in the world, you know, and that it was going to be well beyond tennis you know it was going to be who they were as people and that this moment felt like it could define that yeah totally um and for the record i, I vicaria doesn't look that villainous yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. um okay so let's go down to page um 121 um just just to you know show this nice little payoff here um where where is it uh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. In the stands, there's her father taking the empty seat beside Oracine and the re for the rest of the match, watching, not running. Uh, there it is. 
um, I just think it's, I found that really, really moving when I read that and um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have an, another overall question uh, for you, Zach. So it, it, the story feels, especially with this match, it feels very Rocky-ish. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, like Creed versus Rocky, you know, the whole, I mean, and, and so, um, you know, was this, was this, was Rocky an inspiration or, um, and, and like, how did you know that this was going to be your ending? You know, um, was, was there a template that you may have used? Like you mentioned, you mentioned Aaron Brockovich, but were the other was was did Rocky have anything to do with uh, writing those? Because Javier loves Rocky. So this is like our Rocky. last question for you. Javier, um, <laughs> like fortuitously, I I don't know. I'm writing the next Creed movie, right? And I like that. Came, I mean, I basically like got introduced to them because of the script. But yeah, I mean, I love Rocky. You know, so I certainly that was definitely somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, we also. Tim and I looked and Ray looked a lot at uh, Moneyball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sort of, you know, I think I think the fact that this was factual um, really, you know, so that it never changed. I didn't feel like I had to to fabricate anything to get something. And I also I was I think I was I was just drawn to, to that idea that the victory was not going to be on the field, but was, you know, going to be something character-based right. and I think that, you know, ultimately that maybe was really what I was interested in, in trying to do with the entire film was like, you, you had this huge backdrop of, of, you know, of these iconic celebrities and, and um, really inspirational people and the, you know, the, with the sports dynamic, it was, it had the opportunity to, you know, to live in a big film world, mm -hmm. but that, maybe we could sort of allow that us, that would allow us to sort of Trojan horse in like a, you know, a character study inside of it. And so, and I think that's why Ray was so great at that, that really, you know, I say the movie easily could have become like a Nike commercial. Um, yeah. And instead, I think it's, it's really, it's, it's intimate and it feels like a, you know, an indie movie, um, but played on a really large scale. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, um well it's 5 32 i guess um i'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to the questions <laughs> i feel so bad i mean i'll stick uh, around if people want to but it, if, if we're um uh let's see if there's anything um um so so there's one if you don't mind uh i would love to know zach's process um how many drafts he wrote? I guess, I guess you kind uh, of- the, the, We answered a lot of these. Um, a, a lot of these too, if you go back to the beginning, if you were a little late, we kind of covered um, a lot of this stuff. Um, um, Let's see. Uh, did you have a manager at this point of the, of the process? I did. So I had, um, I had, uh, I'm with a company called Grandview and this guy, Zach Barknowski was awesome. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I had sold a TV show like five years before this, maybe that um, was about tennis, actually. Um, but it never got made. And, you know, I was I had I had gotten other I was working, but, you know, hadn't hadn't had that thing that broke through. And right. um, so, but yeah, I was I had a rep. You see any um, other, uh, Lauren? I think, yeah, I think we're, um, I think that's probably, um, yeah, like in the, we're a huge biopic and, uh, and sports movie fans here. So, uh, so this is like the old, this was like really, really great that this was our first um, full length uh, feature script uh, breakdown. I think it, I think it was good. Uh, a yeah. little, little short on time towards the end there, but um this is awesome, Zach. Thank you so, so, yeah, so much. Thank you much, so much for uh, doing this. For getting that nitty gritty. Uh, oh, yeah, no, it's so fun. I haven't been back through the script in that way. It's fun to fun to see it again. And I, yeah, anytime. I was really glad to oh. do it. Thank you. For well, thinking. thank you and uh, good luck. We can't wait for the next Creed. That's oh. going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Okay. Thank you guys. All right, guys. Well, thank you, you for joining and uh, we'll see you guys another time.